to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. We welcome you today to our study of 1 Timothy. We want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday for Bible study. You'll find people in the Lord's Church who love God, who are concerned about souls, and who more than anything want to help men and women get to heaven. And so stop by and visit the Lord's Church in your area. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about salvation, the church, or, or any matter related to Scripture, you'll find people there who'd be happy to sit down and open up the Bible and study God's Word with you. Friend, we'd also like to help you here at the Gospel of Christ in your desire to know God and His will better. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have lessons on every book of the Old and New Testament and a wide variety of topical studies as well. Uh, if you've got something that you've been studying or thinking about, check it out on our website. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson or any of our lessons in the past, we make those available free of charge. Go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Visit our free media section from there. You can receive a download, digital download, or if you need a hard copy in CD or DVD, we'll mail those to you as well. And as always in our fast-paced world today, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app available for both Android and Apple phones. It's a great way to get updates, stay informed, and study the Word of God in our fast-paced world as well. Today we're thinking about 1 Timothy, and if you don't have your Bible, we want you to pause for just a moment, locate your, locate your Bible, as we're going to think from the Word of God today about the wonderful book of 1 Timothy. What's 1 Timothy all about? Well, we mentioned to you that the key verse and the theme of 1 Timothy is, this is one of the books where it is so clearly stated that we can't really miss it. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15 tells us the key verse and the theme. Paul says, these things I write to you, though I'm hoping to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, now listen to this, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. 1 Timothy is all about church conduct. And when we say church conduct, we're not only talking about how one conducts themselves in the assembly, but just as much outside the assembly. By church conduct, we mean the idea that we are the church everywhere and anywhere we go. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20 through 27, the church is the people, not the building. And therefore, how should Christians conduct themselves as members of the body of Christ in everyday life, which would also include our worship. That's what 1 Timothy is all about. I think one of the key phrases that you will find mentioned over and over, you hear this regularly throughout the book, six times at least in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, Paul will say to Timothy, this is a faithful saying. In essence, he's saying, I want you to listen real carefully, let your ears perk up, get this truth. Here's something I want you to hear. Like the first one, 1 Timothy 1 verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Well, what is it, Paul? Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And so 
Paul will mention several of these sayings throughout 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus to encourage the young evangelist Timothy and Titus. Now let's consider for just a moment a little more in depth what Paul means by the term church conduct. You may know how to conduct yourself in the church of God, which is the house of the living God. Does Paul simply mean how to conduct yourself in worship? Are we talking about learning how to behave and not fidget and stay focused in worship? Not worship alone. That would apply there. But when we talk about church conduct, it's my conduct as a member of God's church. My conduct everywhere as a Christian. Anywhere, anytime, the way I live my life, the way I present myself, friend, that's part of my conduct as a member of the Lord's church. And so really, we could break that down into four areas. Does it include the assembly? Absolutely. How do I behave? How do I conduct myself in the assembly during worship is a big aspect of my Christian life. Am I reverent? Am I trying to stay focused? Am I engaged in the prayers and the singing and the reading of the Bible, and the giving and the preaching, those things? Is my heart where it needs to be in the assembly, but also outside the assembly, in my daily Christian life? This is what the world sees more of than anything. When I'm at the store, when I'm at Walmart, when I'm uh, around other people in the world, whatever it may be, how am I conducting myself? How am I carrying myself as a member of the Lord's church outside the assembly? But then what about the work of the church as it relates to widows, as it relates to evangelism, as it relates to the good works that we're all to follow in the Bible? How's my conduct related to that? And then, of course, as it relates to the organization of the church, elders, the role of elders, the role of deacons, the role of ministers in the church. How do we conduct ourselves as it relates to those ideas as well? It's part of what Paul will discuss in 1 Timothy. And so let's think about some messages, some practical lessons we can learn from 1 Timothy that will help us to have the type of conduct God wants us to have. Open your Bible, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and let's consider that first faithful saying, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at what Paul says to Timothy in verse number 15. The Bible says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then listen to the personal aspect. Of whom? Paul says, I am chief. Friend, when you think about what Christ came for, when we think about the message, the ministry, the purpose of Jesus coming into the world, we can't help but think about the need to save sinners. That's why He came. Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Who's lost? Romans 3 verse 10 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. Ezekiel 18 4 says, The soul who sins will surely die. And so Paul in this very first chapter, he pauses to think about this, this gnomic truth, this amazing principle, Christ came to save sinners. And then he thinks about it personally. Of whom I am chief. Friend, can't we all say that like Paul did? All of sin fall and short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Yes, Jesus came to save the world who's lost in sin, but Jesus came to save me. I'm lost in sin as well. That's His purpose. Th this reminds us of our desperate need for the good news of Jesus. This reminds us of our own inability to save ourselves, all our righteousness. Isaiah said, it's like filthy rags. Isaiah 64 verse 6, I need Jesus and the hope of salvation to be saved. As we think about this idea of salvation and Christ coming to save sinners, I want you to hear something else that's really powerful, a really powerful living message from 1 Timothy is that not only did Jesus come to save sinners, the God of the Bible wants everybody 
to be saved. Open your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I want you to look at what the Scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4. Paul includes these words, Of God who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. My friend, the God of heaven loves everybody. John 3, 16. The God of heaven gave His Son so that everybody could be saved. Hebrews 2, verses 9 and 10. Jesus tasted death for all men. The Bible teaches us not only that Jesus tasted death for all men, but He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. God wants all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. And listen to what Jesus said in, that, in what we know of as that great invitation. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who have labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Friend, God does not want some people to be saved and some people to be lost. God is not a capricious or, or angry God who, who is just waiting for people to mess up so that He can send them to hell. That, that, that's not how the Bible presents God. You want to know the real heart of God? Here it is. God wants all men to be saved. How bad does He want it? He so loved the world, He gave His greatest gift, His only begotten Son, so that people could be saved. John 3, verse 16. And so as you hear the message of 1 Timothy, don't overlook the idea that God has made it possible for every person who will obey His gospel to be saved in Jesus Christ. And friend, as it relates to that idea, of God's desire for people to be saved, let's also realize that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ factors into that because it is described in 1 Timothy as the pillar, the foundation, that from which truth ought to echo forth. Look in your Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 3 with me. I want you to notice this beautiful picture of the church in 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul says, But if I am delayed, I write, so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, listen to this, which is the church of the living God. And then notice this description, the pillar and ground of the truth. Friend, when you think about the church's relationship to salvation and, and the truth, the Bible clearly teaches that the church is to be that which echoes forth the truth. Ephesians 3 verses 10 and 11, it's God's will, it's God's eternal purpose that the church make known the gospel to principalities, to powers, to those in, in high places. God planned from the foundations, from before the foundations, that His church would be the voice to preach out, to spread the truth of the gospel. And friend, that truth is so important. We live in a world today that seems so confused as to what truth is. Oftentimes they're asking the question of Pilate in John 18, verses 36 through 38, what is truth? But friend, when we come to the Bible, we can know what truth is. Jesus said in John 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John chapter 8, verse number 32. The, the Bible says the entirety of God's commands are righteousness and truth. Psalm 119, 160. And the church's relationship with that truth is... We're to preach the word, preach the truth, be in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And then as it relates to this idea of salvation and God's truth, seen in the book of 1 Timothy, friend, I want us to realize the, the relationship of ministers and gospel preachers in God's plan to spread that truth. And the word minister 
And the idea of a minister is not necessarily an official title. All of us are to be servants and ministers of God, of Christ, and of the gospel. And we ought to be concerned first with saving self and then with saving others. Look in 1 Timothy 4, and I want you to see exactly what we're talking about. What does Paul write to the young evangelist Timothy along this theme of salvation? Paul says, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Watch this now. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will both save yourself and all those who hear you. Friend, as God's ministers today, as God's servants, we need to first be concerned with making sure we're saved. My soul is the most important thing I have. Jesus asked, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. I've got to make sure first and foremost that I'm right with God, that I've obeyed the gospel, that I'm living right, that I'm the type of person God wants me to be. And then like the Lord, as ministers of the gospel today, we need to be concerned with those who are without direction, those who are wandering aimlessly and lost outside of Jesus. Let me give you an example. Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 through 38. Jesus looked out on the crowds that were following him, that, that, that mass tumult of people, and Jesus said, Truly, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of hosts he'll send out laborers into his field. Friend, we are those laborers. If you're a child of God, each one of us has the privilege of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Then in chapter 5, for those of us who are children of God, one of the messages that you will hear throughout the New Testament, and especially in the books of 1st and 2nd Timothy, is our need to be, to be pure, to be holy, to try to do what's right in a filthy and immoral world. Look at what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 22. Paul says to Timothy, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Listen to this phraseology. Keep yourself pure. Timothy, you're living in an immoral world. In Ephesus, where it was as common to be involved in immorality as it was anything else. In Ephesus, where they had the, the temple of, of, of Diana, there were a multiplicity of, of prostitutes who practiced immorality as worship to their God. In a, in a, in a society where marrying and divorce and, and ungodliness was a big part of that society, just like it is today. Paul says to Timothy, and he says to Christians today, Rise above that. Be different. Keep yourself morally pure. 1 Peter 2.11 Peter said, I beg you. Listen, listen to the strength of this. I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. In an immoral, dark, filthy, sinful world, Christians have got to rise above that. We've got to strive every day to be pure. I want to be pure sexually. Marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. The proper place for sexual relations is inside the marriage relationship. I want to keep myself pure as it relates to my language. Colossians 3.8, Ephesians 4.29, let no filthy communication come out of your mouth. I want to keep myself pure as it relates to the way, I, the way a person dresses, that we dress modestly. We don't dress like the world in, in, in ungodliness and immorality. We're not, not out to show how much we can show. No, we want, to, we want to dress righteously and modestly in our demeanor, our language, in the way we, in our honesty, in the way we deal with people. Christians want to rise above and keep themselves pure. And then as it relates to walking faithfully to the Lord 
In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul reminds us that in the midst of all of this, we've got to keep fighting the good fight. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 12. Paul says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. He goes on to say, lay hold on eternal life, to which you are also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. These kind of just, these verses just kind of give us an overall theme, an idea of what 1 Timothy is all about. But now let's take just a few moments to think about chapters 1 and 2, and then our next lesson, we'll think about some other chapters as well in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, you have got to stay focused on preaching the one gospel. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Paul says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in the faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith from which some have strayed, have turned aside to idle talk. The one gospel. There is no other gospel, Paul said in Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. It has been delivered once for all, Jude verse 3. And that one gospel in its, in its purity, in its simplicity, in its clarity and saving power, friend, it only comes from the New Testament, from the Bible. If we're going to preach the one gospel, it is not Christ plus these traditions or Christ plus these books or Christ plus what people centuries back have said. No, the one gospel is Christ, period. Just simply preaching, teaching, obeying, and living what we find in the pages of the New Testament. Then in chapter 2, as it relates to our conduct as members of the Lord's body, not only must we preach the one gospel, we've got to realize the proper scope of public prayer. What's the proper scope of public prayer? Look in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I want you to notice what the Bible says beginning in verse number 1. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Now jump down to verse number 8. I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, and like manner also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or costly clothing, but that which is proper for women professing godliness. What's the proper role of of prayer in the Christian life. What's the proper scope of that? Friend, we ought to pray for all people. Kings, those who are in authority, the president, whoever it may be, we ought to pray that God's will will see, they'll seek God's will in their lives, they'll do what God wants, and then we ought to pray that all people be saved. Praying for people to receive the gospel and be saved. And then as it relates to the proper scope of public prayer, Paul says, I desire therefore that men, and that Greek word there is males, men pray everywhere with purity of hands, with purity of heart. Friend, as it relates to proper conduct, when there is an assembly, a mixed assembly of men and women, not only are men to teach, 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12, men are to be the one who lead in public prayer. And then as you think further in the books of 1 and 2 Timothy, friend, we realize, as we mentioned, Paul identifies himself as chief of sinners. Uh, Chapter 2, he realizes the responsibility to pray for all men and how important that is. But then we also realize, as it relates to, to public worship, to conduct ourselves properly as God's church today in the worship of the church. Please hear me well on this. Please hear what the Bible says. 
men are to do the teaching. Women are not to preach and teach. That's not scriptural in a mixed assembly. Now you say, where's that at? Let me show you in the Bible. Direct your attention, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I want you to notice what the scripture says in verses 11 and 12. Paul says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Why? For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Friend, you can't find any clearer language to show that God has placed men in the position of authority and that they are the ones in the mixed assembly who are to teach. You know, oftentimes I hear people say, it's okay to have women preachers. It's okay to have women teachers in a mixed assembly. Friend, you have to pretty much take this out of the Bible to go along with that. Listen to it again. I do not permit a woman to teach. Well, someone says, okay, I, I see what the Bible says there, but you know, in Paul's day and age, and Paul didn't really like women, and that was, wasn't proper then, but things are different today. It is not right. It is not, that idea is not based on Paul or his thinking. That idea goes all the way back to creation. Why is it that men are to be leaders in the home and in the church? Adam, listen to verse 13, Adam was created first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, the woman being deceived. It relates to God's structure of authority, which is not based on Paul's idea or first century idea. It goes all the way back to creation. And so, friend, if we're going to be the church God wants us to be, we've got to have the right conduct in every part of our life. And so today we ask you, are you a member of the Lord's body? Have you obeyed the gospel? If not, we'd love to talk to you more about that, study with you about the idea of salvation. Our hope and prayer today is that you've been encouraged, we've all been encouraged to simply do what God says, and we encourage you to join us next time as we'll study more from the books of First and Second Timothy. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.